Chris Sewell here, baseball card collector, investor, dealer in that order. Welcome everyone. Today I want to do sort of like a cautionary tale about all the prospecting going on. Uh, and you know, most of you probably will understand these concepts already, but just to, to sort of pound the idea home a little bit, you know, uh, prospecting has gotten out of control, especially in the last two and a half years since the pandemic kicked in and, and the sports card boom. You know, prices for players who have never played a game in the majors or the NBA or the NFL uh, off the charts just for in, in terms of speculating on how good they're going to be, you know, two, three, five, 10, 20 years down the down the road. I'm going to focus purely on baseball for this video, although these concepts could obviously be applied to basketball, football, any any of the sports, really. So I grew up collecting in the junk wax era. Uh, and I started collecting cards in 1988, was super into it for a number of years. And uh, 88 to 92 is, is sort of the center of the junk wax era. That's when cards were mass produced. That was really the peak of the hobby in terms of another number of uh, people who were involved. And, and often, you know, today with the, the recent boom has been uh, compared to another junk wax era, just in the, in the overproduction of cards and just how many people are involved in the hobby. And there's definitely similarities. Uh, there's also some serious uh, significant differences. You know, back then there were no, there was no grading, there was no uh, serial numbered stuff or fractors, there was no, you know, inserts or autographs or patch cards, none of that sort of existed yet. So the hobby was very different uh, in, in, in those sort of terms. But I remember in the first few years of collecting just the prospecting that was going on, it was a, on a completely different level because cards weren't rare. They didn't have rare parallel serial numbered inserts. So nothing was rare. So cards didn't get to like crazy prices like we're seeing today where, you know, people can't even afford them. Uh, but they were sort of overpriced, overhyped players. I mean, there's always been that. But in the junk wax era, there was, it was particularly heavy going on like it is today with so many people in the hobby and so many people sort of gambling on who the next great star is going to be. So I've compiled a list of six of the biggest busts during the junk wax era, uh, only focusing on players with rookies from 1988 to 1992 because that was my first five years in the hobby. So I remember these very, very specifically. I remember all six of these players and their card values just being way, way higher than it seemed like they, they should be. But, you know, they hadn't accomplished anything in the, in, the, in the big leagues, but all the prospecting going on around them really drove up their prices and all, all the speculation. And then just sort of imagine if these players existed today, you know, what their card values would, would be going for today if they were prospects in the current uh, card market and just sort of use that as a, a cautionary tale. All right, so the first one I remember is Greg Jeffries, and I specifically remember going into a card store when I was a kid, and I wanted to buy a 1988 Donruss Cal Ripken, and they had one, and it was a dollar, but right next to it was a Greg Jeffries 1988 Donruss, the, the card on the left there, and it was $4, and this made no sense to me as a 10-year-old, as I had never heard of Greg Jeffries, whereas Cal Ripken was one of the best players in baseball, and he was my favorite player on my favorite team. Uh, but So I sort of you know asked why that was, and they quickly explained to me that Greg Jeffries was the top prospect in all of baseball, and... His card, his card values were off the charts because of uh, speculation and everybody assuming he was going to be the next, you know, superstar, all-star, all-time great player. Now, his rookie cards were from 1988. You can see the Donruss and the Fleer on the left and in the middle. But his second-year cards from 1989, you can see the 89 tops on the right, also became extremely valuable. Basically, he became the most expensive card in every set. Now, Greg Jeffries went on to have a pretty solid career. He played 14 seasons in the majors. I uh, got over 1,500 hits. He was actually a two-time All-Star, so he was a you know a solid, solid player for a long time. Uh, one of my favorite stats about him is he actually won uh, Rookie of the Year votes in two different seasons, sort of a loophole in the uh, Rookie of the Year rules. But I also amassed a career WAR of 20, so again a, a, a solid you know respectable career. But you know this is no certainly no Hall of Fame level. He's certainly no long-time star. Uh, his cards today are all commons. You can pick up his rookie cards for for basically a quarter. Now imagine if Greg Jeffries as a prospect was in today's card market with autos and serial numbered cards and graded cards. I mean, I don't know if this is a good comparison as I'm not really up to date with, you know, young prospects in baseball. But uh, this Joe Adele card from 2017 Bowman Chrome Red Refractor, a, a 9.5 from Beckett, sold for over $15,000 two years ago. Now, I, I, I'm, you know, sure that Greg Jeffries was a bigger, bigger speculative prospect at the time than Joe Adele ever was. So Greg Jeffries would have certainly had five-figure card sales all over the place. All right, second we're going to look at is Kevin Moss. And Kevin Moss is a little bit different than the other names on this list in that he was not a highly touted draft pick. He sort of came out of nowhere. His rookie cards are from 1990. He got his 1990 Leaf, tops traded, and upper deck there. And uh, Kevin Moss, like I said, not a high draft pick. He was drafted in the 22nd round, so not on anybody's radar. 
But in 1990, uh, he started. He just basically went on a tear for half a season. He had 21 home runs in only 79 games, and his card values just absolutely exploded around this and shot up way to the moon uh, to, to totally sort of unreasonable speculative prices, which might mean that his card values were 5 bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, something like that. But remember, Kevin Moss did not have any rare cards. He only had overly mass-produced cards from the junk wax era. Uh, so for a card, you know, be 5 10 20 bucks, that was incredibly high for uh, for the time. Now, Kevin Moss really never did anything else in his career. He uh, had one more season where he hit 20 home runs, but uh, batted 220 that season, and he had a career war of just 1.5. So really just not, not a uh, notable player beyond the uh, one sort of half season. Our right, next one is Ben McDonald, and I was a huge Baltimore Orioles fan at the time, so I know this one well. Ben McDonald was the first overall pick and one of the you know top pitching prospects in, in a number of years. His rookie cards are from 1990. He got his Donruss, his tops, and his upper deck there. The upper deck was a big one as it had the cool uh, shot uh, looking up into the clouds. But these were big money cards back in the day as everyone was speculating around how great he was going to be. Uh, and of course, today they're they're essentially commons. Now, McDonald did have an all right career. He played nine seasons. He won ten games uh, four different times, and he ended up with a career WAR of twenty. That's you know very respectable. But these aren't these aren't stats that are going to take you you know be all time great status or even even take you out of the uh, out of the common bin. If we wanted to compare him to somebody today, again, I don't know if these are good comparisons or not. But here's a 2019 Bowman Wander Franco Superfractor 101. That sold for close to fifty thousand dollars about a year ago. Ben McDonald would certainly have had lots of card sales in this sort of range, perhaps even uh, even higher. All right, next one. Who remembers the uh, Todd Zeal hype? Rookie cards from nineteen ninety. Got his Donruss, his score, and his tops there on screen. And Todd Zeal's, I think, a good example, uh, kind of similar to Greg Jeffries and Ben McDonald that we saw earlier. You know, Todd Zeal had a solid career. He ended up with. Uh, he ended up playing 16 seasons. He had over 2,000 hits, had a career war of 20. These are all, you know, he's a notable player in baseball history, but he was never really a star. He didn't play in any all-star games, but he had a solid career. And this is sort of the most standard outcome when you deal with uh, hot prospects is they end up with okay careers and, you know, some good seasons here and there, but nothing that's going to set their card market on fire. And so the problem is when with someone like a Todd Zeal or all the prospects today, is when their cards come out of the gate so high. I mean, before they've ever accomplished anything, their card prices are so high, there's very, very little room for them to grow. I mean, they really have nowhere to go but down unless the player truly explodes at a, you know, beyond expectations, which is, is so rare. Most players end up having good, solid careers, but if their card values start off so high and they end up just having good, solid careers, they're going to just drop tremendously. I mean, Todd Zeal, again, solid career here. His cards are, are commons. And all the players on this list, with the exception of Kevin Moss, were uh, essentially can't-miss prospects. Like, this guy is definitely going to be an all-time great. That was the, the mentality at the time. If you want to compare it to some today, someone today, look at this Bobby Witt. 2020 Bowman Chrome, Gold Refractor Auto, numbered out of 50. PSA Gem Mint 10, sold earlier this year for $67,000. Absolutely, there would have been Todd Zeal sales in this uh, ballpark. All right, next up is Todd Van Poppel, a pitcher for the Oakland A's. He was a high draft pick and a heavily uh, hyped prospect. Rookie cards were from 1991, Bowman, Score, and Upper Deck. I remember his card values being the uh, most valuable card in every 1991 set for probably a good uh, good year or so. Uh, Van Poppel really just didn't pan out at all. He ended up with a career-winning uh, record of 40-52, and 52, never won 10 games in a season, and had a career war uh, below zero. And pitchers tend to be riskier than batters when it comes to prospects. Is I think there's more outside things that are out of their control, particularly particularly with injuries and things like that. Uh, here's a here's a comparison: 2018 Bowman Chrome Lewis Robert Red Refractor Auto, numbered out of five. This went for $137,000 plus earlier uh, early 2021. I mean, Lewis Robert was a highly highly hyped prospect but so was Todd Van Poppel I would guess that they were pretty comparable in terms of their uh, you know overhyped speculation for the time all right and the last one we're going to look at is Brian Taylor who was the number one overall draft pick in the 1991 draft and he was called by uh, by some as the uh, the greatest pitching prospect of all time his rookie cards are from 1992 he got his Bowman his tops and his uh, tops redemption auto on the right the tops in the middle that was the card in the hobby for for a while 
the auto redemption was really really hard to get on the right i, I don't i don't think i've ever even seen one in person but uh that card was obviously off the charts as well now taylor fell off quick he was uh like i said the first overall draft pick and he never made the majors one of the very few first overall draft picks to never make the major leagues just never never got anything going uh, very poor numbers in the minor leagues and was basically out of baseball by the end of the decade if Brian Taylor were a prospect in today's card market, I think it's safe to say that he his you know Super Fractor 101 Auto uh, PSA 10 first Bowman Chrome card would have been very similar to this Jason Dominguez, which sold for uh, just short of half a million dollars earlier this year. And obviously, you know Taylor, that card would have plummeted to basically zero by the end of Taylor's career. But that's it for the uh, cautionary tale. Any prospects you remember, you know, card values being super high. Over the years, again, I only sort of looked at a five-year window, but there's been prospects from all sorts of different eras where their card values were were crazy high. Let me know in the comments if you if you have any that you specifically remember. And appreciate everyone watching, and see you all again next time. Thanks, everyone.